week, Matthew chapter 14. Those watching online, thank you for tuning in today at the Little Country Church. Amen. Glad to have you. Hallelujah. And don't forget our new uh, website, holywild.net. Amen. So a lot of things you can find on that. Oh, there you are. I got to always give you an opportunity because it just looks funny on camera again. <laughs> giving you the moment. I sure enjoyed worship this morning. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 14, are you comfortable? I had to engage in worship on my way to church this morning. It's one of the few ways that I can realign myself and remind myself not to feel sorry for myself. You say, Pastor, you do that? Absolutely, I do that. I go through times of depression and things, and I, 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 I literally just kind of shake that devil. I just got to shake him off because I, I don't believe in possession of believers. I do believe that you can be oppressed. Amen. You can't allow certain things to come in. So I just start worshiping in my truck and reminding myself of the goodness of God. And then, and then I do that one thing that affects you every time. I begin to realize your problem ain't as bad as anybody else you know. Amen. Everybody got stuff they're dealing with. Amen. Listen to that. Bless their heart. I'm telling you, everybody got stuff they're dealing with. Amen. So this message, my friend, is not for everyone. It's not. It is not for those who live their lives looking through rose-colored glasses. It's not for those who, with pious attitudes as it relates to their own self-righteousness. For the person that has never suffered the pain of disappointment, this message is not for. Or the pause of their destiny, this message will not fit you either. This word will not apply to those that believe that they will never go through anything that could cause a setback in their lives. This message is for people, real people, that have been through things that they saw take other people out, yet they survived it. This week I watched a, uh, a documentary on Mount Everest, and I saw that in 2019, 12 people died on Mount Everest trying to scale that mountain. It became a log jam. They had a... Uh, the uh, the storms hit, things happen, the loss of oxygen. And I thought to myself, God, sometimes life to me feels this way. Amen. I'm trying to move up. I'm trying to take mountains. You say, yeah, I can take mountains and I want to do that. And yet I see carnage on the side. I don't want to get into that place, God. Help me to not move there. So this, this message may not fit you, but this word will not apply to those that believe that they'll never go through anything that could cause a problem. This message, my friend, is for you because I know you. Real people that have been through things, that have saw take over, that took other people out, yet they survived it. It is for those who look around and realize, if it was not been for the God's grace and mercy, I would not be in this building today. On, yes, my destiny is secure. However, there are times my determination is shaken. My purpose is clear, yet there are seasons my passion wanes. My faith is strong, yet there is, this, there is fear that ever lurks. It is the paradox the Apostle Paul often brought to our attention in 2 Corinthians 7, 5, when he says, on the outside, I'm fighting. I look good on the outside. People say, look at that man go. Look, look at him moving on. But on the inside, there are fears. There are things that are shaking me, and i got to deal with it. But on the outside, it looks like I'm doing all right. There are so many people on the verge of giving up, and I'm going to tell you, don't do it. Hang in there. Amen. Like your pastor, i just got to keep hanging. You may be one step away from your breakthrough, from your miracle, from the manifestation of everything you believe for. You must survive to thrive. And I say that because there is this thought that, you know, hey, don't just survive, thrive. Well, I've tried that. The bottom line is if you don't survive, you'll never thrive. If you don't get through what you're going through right now, you ain't never going to thrive. And many times we're saying to ourselves this whole year, we just want to overcome 2020. What happens if you overcome 2020 to find out that 2021 is worse than 2020? Amen. You've got to survive what's going on now in order to thrive what's coming up next. So my issue is just getting through it and, and learning how to survive through it. Last week we talked about wave walkers. And one of my favorite passages out of Matthew 14, verse 25. That wave walkers, first they recognize it's God's presence. That ain't just a ghost walking on the water. That's God himself. Second, they discern between faith and foolishness. There's a time for faith. Be careful of foolishness. Sometimes we get them mixed up. We say, well, I'm just going to drive like a maniac. You can't do that. I, mean, I just came off of a whole truckload of curves over in Tennessee and North Carolina. I can promise you that if the speed limit says a certain thing, you might want to pay attention to it. 
Because if you over push it, you're going to get yourself foolishness. So be careful. Learn to discern the which is right. Get out of the boat and expect problems. Matthew 14, 25, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come down on the water. Come, he said. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, not the waves, but the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Mentioned last week, shortest prayer in the Bible. Amen. And he immediately was pulled up out of the water. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, called him. You have a little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. When did the wind die down? When they got back in the boat. It didn't die down while they were walking on the water. But when they got back in the boat. Amen. I, I believe that there's times in life you got to learn to live boatless. Can I get an amen? Amen. The storm's blowing. You're still walking. The wind is, is against you, but you're living boatless. Amen. You just got out of that boat and you walked on the water. Father, thank you for the word. God, my lips be anointed to hear, for our ears to hear, to catch, to understand. God, calm my spirit. Let this word be clear in a, clar a clarion call in Jesus' name. And everyone said. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. First, last week we talked about there's always a call. Come, he said to him. When God asked ordinary people to enlarge in an act of extraordinary trust, walk in where he walked. So it's an amazing thought. Peter said, if it's you bid me come, he says, come. Peter gets down out of the boat. I don't know exactly how all that worked out. My mind is so imaginary. Amen. I see him checking the water out first, getting out of the boat, climbing out, walking toward Christ, and looking him eye to eye. Amen. And when he took his focus off of Jesus, he began to sink. There is always fear of getting out or doing something that you've never done before. God has this habit of asking people to do things that are scary to them. He just, you know, doing the easy stuff is easy, but doing something that's scary to stepping out of the boat, well, that's something else. That's why we've always said you got to learn how to do it afraid. There are things in life you just do afraid. And by the way, over the last eight or nine months, I promise you, God's been asking you to get out of the boat. Many of us, through media and science and medical, fear has, has locked us down. My, in my heart, and I know I'm talking to people right now that have not been to this house in months, my heart breaks because I've not seen you. I've not connected with you. I hate this virus. Amen. Um, that has caused people to stay in the boat, to stay locked down, to listen to, to search, uh, what I call liberal media. Amen. They just pump it up. It's misinformation after misinformation. You know, our president made a statement that I absolutely agree with. you got to learn to live with it. When did I say that? I said it in February that this thing was like copperheads and black widows. you got to learn to live with it. Amen. They're out there. you just got to know how to deal with it. This virus is out there. Learn how to deal with it. We're going to have to... It's, it's never going away. Come on. Amen. You, you know, if we're, the thing against me is the church world, the, no, I'm not talking about you so much, but the church world has locked down in fear when they ought to be full of faith, when they ought to be wave walking, stepping out and believing God for great things. Instead, we've allowed the world to tell us to stay cocooned and to back away. I ain't having it no more. I just can't have it. I just, it's, not a, it's not even my life. Amen. And I say, God, and let me be honest. I know I could get in a little trouble with this. I have done funeral after funeral after wedding after wedding and a funeral after funeral and wedding and church service. I've been in groups of people. I shake hands. I've touched people, been around folk. And still, still, God has protected me. Amen. And I'm not boasting on Jerry. I'm not boasting on my faith. I'm just telling you that, that we've got to get to a place in life that you've got to keep living. Amen. You got to keep your businesses open. You got to keep on going out. You got to be among folk. Uh, you know, it just, it just drives, it's, it's, it, it takes me over the edge. And I will continue to do funerals. And one day you'll have the blessing of being at mine. Come on, give me an amen. Oh, come on. Y'all so funny. I ain't going to say that in the next service. That was a soapbox that just God just had to get on. Hallelujah. 
John 16, 18 says, A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. And when they had rolled three, or three and a half miles, amen, they saw Jesus approaching the boat. Do you understand how far three and a half miles is on the water? James, that's a long way. Amen. That's pushing, man. That's striving. That's, that is all the exertion I got. Three miles, three and a half miles. Yeah, I've done everything I could. And the Scripture says they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. They were terrified. I'm going to give you another a verse that's not written down, but I just want you to know it. The scripture says that Jesus would have passed by them. He would have passed by them had they not called out. He got close enough for them to see him, and he would have passed by them. And I ask myself at times, how many times has Jesus walked right past us and we never initiated a call or, or reached out or gave him attention or said, God, here I am. Amen. I need your help. We watch him walk on by and we're over here. <laughs> God, help me. And he's walking by. He's right there. And so they cry out. You know why he was walking by them? You know the story, the real reason why he was making better time than they were. Yeah. Why do I need to get in a boat with y'all? Y'all ain't going nowhere fast. I'm making a lot of good time walking here. So he keeps on walking by them. They're terrified. Then they call out. Then there's the connection. Then when he gets in the boat, the wind dies down. Everything's good. So here it is, my friend. We have these fears, the fear of inadequacy. I don't know if I can do it. The fear of failure. What if I fail? But what if you succeed? What about just the plain old fear of God, amen, that gets inside of us? When Jesus had come to Peter, he got down out of the boat, walked on the water toward him, saw the wind, amen, and began to sink. What happened was reality. Reality sets in. And I've heard people say to me, Pastor, you just define reality. Reality is we've got uh, the, these situations right now that are going on in the world. It, it's rea that's a reality. I know that. But my faith has always said that there's this thing called supernatural power. Amen. They're super believing in God for great things. I have to distinguish between faith and food. I just don't go, you know, rub up on people that I think that are sick. But sometimes I do. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I lay hands on people whose bodies are scalding hot from fever. I've done this my whole life. Why? Because Jesus told me to. Amen. He told us not to run away from people. Amen. To be near them. Amen. To lay hands. And I'm, I'm so bothered by the fact that this disassociation because of this virus is causing more deaths. And loneliness in, in, in places like convalescent homes and nurseries and places like that. You know, you, you can't even touch your baby when it's born. You can't even connect with parents who are in the... In the it, it, I, I had such a joy uh, a week ago for a whole group of people come to see my mama. Amen. You don't understand how that set my mama free. How it blessed my mama for people to gather around her when she'd been hearing news and things of that nature and isolating herself and to get around and watch her smile. Amen, to feel the touch and the warmth of her son and all the others around her. It blessed her day. Amen. So I'm saying to you that there is the difference in foolishness and faith, and maybe I haven't found it yet, but I lean strongly on my faith. Amen. Believe in God for the best. Can I get an amen? What happens when you see the wind? The obstacles, the ways, the unexpected conflict saps our spirit. Plans go awry. Amen. People let us down. The economy zigs when it should have zagged. See the wind. Remember, first, everything is risky. If you're looking for safety, you're in the wrong species. Amen. You're, you're, you're wrong. I remember, I reminded of yet another assignment to dig out of another flood and another flood and another flood. You'd think we'd have gave up after the fourth one, Joseph. But amen. But we stayed with it. I, you know, after four floods, I, I could be a, 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 I don't know, what do you call them, a, a, a construction supervisor. Amen. I mean, I've learned a little bit more than what I did I mean, while still casting hope for our future. Uh, we, we've been on the edge uh, financially in our church when I didn't even let you know it, and God pulled us out. We've seen the wind, and wave walkers expect problems. The other disciples are probably wondering, I wonder how far Peter going to take this. I mean, have you ever thought about it? It was Peter that said, Lord, if it's you, bid me come. Matthew looks over it. John and says, all right. Let's see what he's going to do this time. You know that guy? Do y'all know him? Amen. There's a, there's a man and woman out there just like that. And they walk, I wonder how far he's going to go. And, and then it happened. He got down out of the boat, and he walked on the water toward Jesus. Amen. He's focused. He abandons himself utterly to the power of Christ. And for the first time in history, two are now walking on the waves. Then it happened. He saw the wind. Reality set in. What was I thinking? 
What was I thinking? Was I thinking I could walk on water? Now, I don't know if he's 20, 30 feet from the boat, but what was I thinking here? What really happened is Peter's focus shifted when he saw the wind, full of excitement about serving God, new job, blue skies. Then, amen, it sets in. You get out of the boat, you get set back to opposition, unexpected obstacles, the wind hits. Sure, it's rough being boatless, but there's no guarantee that life in the boat is going to be any safer. Hey Amen. There's no guarantee of that. I, I, this lady, Ellen Goder, wrote, You can live on a bland food so as to avoid an ulcer, drink no tea, coffee, on, or other stimulants in the name of health, go to bed early, stay away from nightlife, avoid all controversial subjects, as to never give offense, mind your own business, avoid involvement in other people's problems, spend money only on necessities, and save all you can, and you can still break your neck in the bathtub. Larry Lawton, a philosopher of science, said, after studying risk in our society, he says we live in a society that is fear-driven, that we suffer from what is known as risk lock. It locks us down. It, all of a sudden, we're locked. risk lock is a condition that leaves us unable to do anything, to go anywhere. You see it in phobias, where people are afraid to get on elevators, afraid of heights, they're afraid of, uh, of, of moving too fast, they're afraid of places like that it's a, it's risk like it locks you down remember everything is risky you you know you stay home in bed amen you can fall out of bed i think i read that a, a half million people get injured falling out of bed you hide yourself behind venetian blinds and, well anyway i'll just leave it alone well when, when he saw the wind he was afraid and beginning he cried out lord save me lewis and clark expedition after two years this was these guys that went across the U.S., amen, of battling nearly insurmountable odds. Hunger, fatigue, desertion, hostile enemies, severe illness, viruses, death. The party had reached the headwaters of the Missouri River. They were led to believe that they were a day away from the Columbia River that would take them to the Pacific Ocean. The hard part was now behind them. Heroes they would be. And so they thought Meriwether Lewis left the party, climbed the bluffs, amen, hoping to see the waters that would carry them the rest of the way to the Pacific. Imagine what he felt when instead he laid eyes on the Rocky Mountains. And I'm, I'm getting nervous because I think to myself, we are climbing through 2020. We are pressing through this year, hoping to see the Pacific, only to see the Rocky Mountains. Amen. <clears throat> what do you do then? How do you handle life then? What do you do when you think your biggest problems are behind you only to find out you've just been warming up? Amen. All that was a trial to get you ready, a test to get you ready for what you're fixing to go through. How do you rally the rest of the troops? Hold on. Hold on, guys. Don't, don't come up yet. I have a little surprise for you. In life, we often hope for a downstream ride only to find. I think that's yours. <laughs> Is it yours? That's somebody's. Bless your heart. In life, we often hope for a downstream. Isn't it good? It ain't yours. <laughs> In hope, we often ask for a down, downstream ride, only to find we're fixing to climb our highest mountains. To survive, you got to thrive. Amen. you got to keep on going. It will challenge our creativity, take tremendous perseverance, lead to spectacular sights, unforgettable memories, build tremendous confidence. You know, I've, I've never asked God for an easy life, but I realize moving through life has its difficulties, but all the difficulties came with scenery. All the difficulties came with, with learning experiences, things that I picked up on. A study of prisoners of war have found that people generally respond to traumatic problems in one or two ways. First, men are simply defeated by such difficult conditions. As I pass through people and I find them hitting a difficult, some folk just walk away. They just forget it. Others, though, they find something else. They find something good in it. They have resiliency, a condition whereby they actually enlarge their capacity to handle problems and in the end not only survive but grow. Resilient people continually seek to assert some command and control over their destiny rather than seeing themselves as passive victims. Resilient people have a larger than, unu than usual capacity for what might be called moral courage for refusing to betray their values. Resilient people find purpose and meaning in their suffering. Now, I'll tell you this. When I was a little boy, we, uh, my, my brother and my sister and I, we were all pretty close, stair-stepped together. We shared the same room when we were little. And, and during Christmas time, we had a door, uh, a wooden door. Not, there was no handle on our door. There was a lock, a latch, one of these latches. And it was on the outside of the door. Most teenagers and kids have locks on the inside of their door. Ours was on the outside. 
So my parents would put us in there, and you know, I just think about this. I think if, you, if this was today, oh my goodness, my parents would probably be in jail. They would lock us in. If they tell you to go to bed, you better go to bed. They'd lock that door. So they, but, but all you had to do is push the door, and it'd crack like that right there. And you could see out into the living room. And on Christmas morning, I remember pushing that door and peeking out. Me and my brother peeking out that door. Look, and I saw it. One of those bozo the clowns. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It got the red nose on it. And you punch it and you go, Wick! every time you punch it, Wick! it goes like that. And it's got this round sand bottom on it. So the bottom made out of sand. And you walk up that thing and you punch it. Amen. And when you hit it, it go down and come back up. You punch it, it go down and come back up. And I thought to myself, God, I wish your people had round butts that were resilient, that when they are hit, they go down and they come back up. Can I get an amen? That's what resilient people do. You can't keep them down. They're going to pop back up. You know, when I read the story of Joseph, I see a man that was hit down and came back up, hit down and came back up. When I see his life, I see these good news, bad news, good news story in his life. Joseph is daddy's favorite. Everybody say good news. Come on, say good news. He's daddy's favorite. But his brothers hate him. That's bad news. Everybody say bad news. His dad gives him a beautiful coat. Uh -huh. But his brothers rip it off, cover it in blood, pretend he's dead, sell him in slavery into a distant land. That's bad news. That's right. So in Genesis 39, 2, the scripture says the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. He lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in the eyes of the Lord because he was his attendant Potiphar. And became his attendant, Potiphar, put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to, to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household, of all things that he owned, the Lord blessed his household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and on the field. Now watch. Joseph's life was blessed, favored of the son. And again, favor follows whoever's favoring the father. He's favored. Then his brothers take his coat, throw him in a ditch uh, or a pit. Didn't they take him, sell him? him off it's bad news he ends up in in Potiphar's house and now things are being blessed what was Potiphar, Potiphar's house all about it was preparing him for Pharaoh's house amen everything you went through now that's why in in life they say don't give a lot of things over to a novice or somebody who's just getting started you got to grow into this thing this is process in life you fall you get up you get up you fall you get up you fall you get up and you keep on moving and here's this man of God Joseph man he said this thing took years for him to manifest maturity to be able to handle what was going to go to go on in Egypt but here he is in Potiphar's house and it looks like things are going good he runs his boss's business well that's good Potiphar's wife puts a move on Joseph that's bad Joseph runs that's good she lied about him he ends up in prison that's bad in jail he predicts the butler would be paroled that's good the butler forgot to help Joseph that's bad sound like anybody's life you know Amen. From week to week, good to bad, he just keeps on rolling like that. But what matters in a good news, bad news story is the last turn. How will it end? He survived in order to thrive. Though Joseph wore the coat of favor and big dreams of his brothers bound down, he's about to see the wind. Now he's penniless, powerless. He's back in prison. The, the butlers forgot about him. Friendless, homeless, he's about to learn that each of us sooner or later comes to know, and that is your heart is revealed and your character is forged when life does not turn out the way you planned. Say that again, preacher. Your heart is revealed and your character is forged when life does not turn out the way you planned. I had these plans. I had these ideas. I had these dreams. I had this idea of marriage. I had this idea of ministry. I had this idea of business. I had these ideas of kids, of having these wonderful kids. And oh, they were wonderful when they were one and a half. <laughs> but at 15, whoo, Jesus, help me, God. Hallelujah. The water's not smooth. The wind is up. The storm strikes. Amen. Now it's on. What are, what are the decisions that you make during this storm? It's going to force first resilient people to exercise control rather than passively resigning. I ain't giving up. 
I've rode three and a half miles. My arms are tired, but my legs are strong. Is that you, Jesus? Yes. Bid me come. Come. I'm getting out of this boat. I'm tired of being in here with these knotheads. See, some of you don't realize that what got him out of the boat might have been the other 11 and not just Jesus. Amen. Sometimes that's how it works. Prisoners of wars that triumph over adversity share a common trait. They had a sense of command over their future. They exercise. When you study these guys, it's amazing what they went through and how they made it. They, they exercise programs. They memorize stories. They memorize the Word of God. They invented new games. Some developed secret signals to communicate with other prisoners. It would be the stroke of the broom or the dragging of a sandal. They encouraged each other without even saying things. Joseph's charm life is just a memory now. He's a prisoner far from home, separated from dad, betrayed by his brothers, kidnapped, surrounded by strangers. He sees the wind, but the Lord is with him. And the scripture says God favored him. Even into the prison, God favored him. Sometimes the worst thing that can happen to you can lead you to the best thing in your life. Daniel in exile took control of his diet. Peter and the apostles refused a gag order against preaching the gospel and a get out of jail free card. Paul and Silas sing praises to God at midnight as a way to see the first jailhouse rock. Faith believes that with God, we are never helpless victims. Amen, Joseph, you help me out. Because Joseph did not quit, he set in motion the development of his potential, the deepening of his faith and endurance that would one day enable him to become the greatest leader Egypt had ever had and to fulfill the part God had intended for him to play in the rescue of his family and the redemption of the world. And guys, without going into the Scripture, you have to read it, but you got to understand that Joseph, Pharaoh had the dream. And Joseph interpreted it, that there'd be seven years of prosperity and then seven bad years. We've not been through the bad years. When we speak of bad years, you know what we speak of? The Great Depression. What my daddy went through. That's what we speak of. When we, my age, speak of it, we, we speak about 2008. That was a bad year. Economically bad year. You know, we look back, but we've not gone through what these guys. We had a drought a few years ago. The ponds dried up. The trees cracked. It was terrible. One year. They went through seven years of drought. But because God had placed this young man who came from obscurity, from a pit, to a guy's household, now into a palace after prison, what a life. He saw the wind. And he says, guys, if you listen to me, Seven years, we're going to save up. We're going to save. And then the other seven, we're going to get through it. Now, during that seven years, the miracle came. His brothers were starving. Daddy said, I don't know what's going on, but the economy of Egypt is better. Go down to Egypt and see if you can get some corn, something to sustain us. And they went down to Egypt, and they walked into a room. And there he was, Joseph. They didn't recognize him. It had been years since they had thrown him in that pit. I just reminded in my own life, there are things that, that I got to forgive. I got to let it go. And I read this story, and it's like I'm preaching to me. And they walk in that room, and they stand before him. And Joseph said, I'll give you all this food. He didn't tell him who he was, but he said, you got to leave the little brother here. He said, excuse me, leave the little brother here and take this food back to your daddy. So he took the food back to daddy, left Benjamin there. Then they came back for him, if I remember the story correct. They came back. He recognized that it was Joseph. And, and I'm just paraphrasing a lot of the story. But there was that connection of Isaac. You know what Isaac, you know what his name means? Laughter. It's one of the, name, one of the names of Isaac is, is laughter. Abraham and Sarah, wasn't it right, had Isaac. Do you know what Abraham and Sarah did when the angel said, you're going to have a baby? They laughed. So God gave them a son called laughter. I, just love, I, love, I love the scripture, man. I just love how it works. So he goes back, and there's that reconnecting again of family because one young man decided not to be bitter, and he forgave his brothers. 
It's an amazing story. Resilient people find a way to overcome. Resiliency, a condition whereby they actually enlarge their capacity to handle problems. And in the end, not only survive, but grow. Growth occurs when you seek to exert control. God, I want control. This is why, where we're at today in America and around the world, I refuse to give my control over to the state, the government, anyone else. I know what's best for my health. I take care of me. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, your servant went around and around and around this morning. Yet I know there was an impact. To be resilient. As a matter of fact, God, I know that it's for somebody that's watching right now. That wants to give up. That wants to quit. They've had setbacks in their life. But I see a comeback coming. I see them coming back up. I see depression leaving them. I see better days ahead. So I speak in the name of Jesus. Strengthen our faith. Give us the ability to rise above. Don't allow us to wallow in self-pity. God, remind us that what's ahead is greater than what's behind. God, even heaven, I'm looking toward heaven right now, knowing that what we do here is going to matter there. God, I speak, God, that the depression leaves those whose funerals I did yesterday, Lord, and the day before, that those who said, God, mama's gone, daddy's gone. God, I pray in the name of Jesus, give them the ability to stand up on their shoulders to be widened, widened out, God, to be able to handle what's ahead. God, I thank you, Lord, that finances will come into the lives of the people of God. You will prosper them. You will bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. I want you to set in motion something for your future. And the only way you can do that is to not give up. You've got to set in motion. Uh, you know, it's, it's the one thing that got, bothers me the most is if I leave this planet too early, what happens to my kids and grandkids? What happens to you? So God, help me set in motion in my life something that's going to bless the next generation. Amen? Amen. If I get my servant leaders to prepare, there should be a tithe and offer an envelope around you. Again, if you're giving online, amen, go to holywild.net slash give. There are several ways to do that. I'm going to need your help. How many plan on being here this Saturday for the trunk or treat to bless the kids? You guys are going to do that. Thank you so much. Amen. We want to get here by around 5 o'clock. We want to line up on the other side of the fence. We want to allow people to come in on this side. We're going to have to watch the traffic. Please bring flashlights. We do have lights out there, but we want to make sure that it's bright enough and that we're able to take care of the kids and they're having a good time. Amen. From 6 to 8 this Saturday night. And then let's make it fellowship. Amen. I don't expect to see you showing up as a devil. All right. Somebody else may show up and we'll just smile at them and cast it out. Or I mean, we'll just smile at them. Amen. Love on them. But on the flip side, you know, as far as we go, be smart with how you dress. Amen. Amen. Brother David, if you'd come. Thank you, Joseph. Give God one more praise. Would you do that? Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. November 15th, now through the 15th, uh, Taden's Pantry. Time to buy some groceries to help out our food pantry with goods for Thanksgiving. Um, it says uh, boxes, grab a grocery list, buy some groceries on the list, bring groceries to the church next Sunday. Um, it's that easy. So basically, anything that's not going to spoil and that somebody's going to use for uh, Thanksgiving dinner, that's what they're asking for. <coughs> Um, and, and always there's going to be people that come that, that are going to need help. Uh, we, we have people come to the church, I don't know, three, four, five times a week just asking for money, asking for food, ask, so that any, any of that helps, um, especially with our own people that need it in our church. October 20th, two or more prayer group uh, meet every Tuesday night except for the first week of the month. Join the prayer team Tuesday night. Drop your prayer request in the box in the back of the church. See HD or D uh, for details. Anything? I know H was here. Oh, yeah, he's still there. There he is. I was like, I know he was here. I saw him this morning. I had to brag to him about shooting a deer. Uh, anything you want to say about that? Come on. And, and, that, and that's serious, guys. Uh, they, when they get together and they're praying, they they want to pray for you. They And we all need something 
in our lives that we need prayer for. And if not, you can pray for me because I, you lay hands on me because I, I have lots of things I need prayer for. And, uh, and so I just encourage you, <laughs> right? I, I encourage you, just uh, slip a little note in the back, put your name on it. Look, it, it, the Bible says, be specific in what you pray. And the reason is God wants to bless you and he wants it. It's okay if your friends and the people in this house understand that you have struggles. Because like Pastor said, we all have struggles. Believe it or not, people in this room have probably struggled with something you're going through right now. And they might be able to help you with it, but they'll never know and they'll never be able to help you if you don't let them know. Um, yeah, and then, and then absolutely, it's, that's the other thing. It's come. Tuesday night, be a part. Come and pray. And, and it's amazing how iron sharpens iron. When you leave here, you're going to feel like, wow, you know what? This helps my week. It makes me feel better. It, it sharpens me and prepares me for the things that I'm going to have to face. Uh, October uh, 31st is the Trunk or Treat. Um, again, th this is a, for our community. This is for our kids. And we want our kids to be able to have a safe place. But the world is looking to see if the church can still be that. And if we don't give them opportunity, they'll never know. And it's, it's, it's as simple, look, just throw some stuff in your trunk, put some candy in there, let little kids come by, encourage them, have a little game. It's amazing how a little gesture like that will cause people to want to know what's happening inside of these walls. And when they come in here, they can experience Jesus. And that is what's going to change their lives. Amen. But this is just another bait. And if the best bait I ever seen for kids is candy. <laughs> Amen. I promise you, have a piece of candy. My kids will like you. If, you do, if my kids don't like you right now, just have candy. They will like you. It, it works 100% of the time. I promise. Doesn't even have to be that great. It could be like some cheapy Walmart candy. They do not know the difference. It has sugar in it. They're good. So just bring some candy for that. Um, and again, we're just reaching out to our community, guys. We want the people in this community to know that we are a lighthouse, that we are a place where the Bible says that it was called Bethel, which means a house of bread. And what happened was for a long time, the bread had been removed from the house, but we're a place that has bread. And if they will come, they will find it. Amen. We want to continue to do that. Today, as we give, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. We love you guys and bless y'all. I'm going to pray real quick and we'll get out of here.